Uh, good evening. My name is Scott Enzer. I'm a board member at the Baltimore Museum of Industry. We're so thrilled to welcome all of you to an unusual year, uh, but we're excited to have our first ever virtual happy hour. Uh, tonight, we're going to hear from a historian and three local brewers about working in Baltimore's brewing industry in the past as well as the present, exploring how the pandemic is affecting excuse me, affecting this growing industry. For those of you not familiar with the BMI, our museum is inside of a 19th century oyster cannery, and we're located on the waterfront just south of Baltimore's Inner Harbor, the Key Highway. We are dedicated to telling the stories of the workers and entrepreneurs who built Baltimore into a manufacturing powerhouse. Programs like the one you're about to see this evening are made possible to the, uh, through the generous support of our members and donors. If you're currently a supporter, thank you so much, uh, especially during the times we're going through right now. We can't uh, thank you enough for being here once again this evening. If you'd like to find out more about how you can make a donation or become a member, our website is thebmi.org. Your support will help ensure that we can continue to engage people in important conversations like the one we're looking forward to tonight. Just a few bits of housekeeping uh, before we begin. This discussion is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel in the coming days. Your camera and microphone are currently turned off, but we definitely welcome your participation. Uh, if you could use the Q&A feature, which you'll find along the bottom of the screen to submit your uh, questions to the presenters, uh, we'll see that everyone's questions get answered this evening. So let us know if you're having technical difficulties through the chat function. Uh, we'll begin with a brief presentation and then move to an interactive discussion with the three brewers. Uh, we should be done by about eight o'clock. So this evening, I am so pleased to welcome Teresa McCullough as our presenter. Teresa is curator of the American Brewing History Initiative at the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of American History, where she is building an archive of the history of home brewing and craft beer in the United States. She earned her PhD in American Studies and an MA in History from Harvard, a culinary arts diploma from the Cambridge School of Culinary Arts and a BA in the Romance Languages from Harvard. She's currently writing a book about the history of food and race in New Orleans. Thanks so much for being here, Teresa, and to our three brewers. Cheers, everybody. I'm gonna hand it over to you now, Teresa. Okay, thank you very much, Scott. And uh, thank you so much to all of you for being here this evening. Um, I am going to share my screen with you. Okay. All right. Um, I really appreciate everyone being here. Uh, as you'll hear, hear very shortly from my fellow presenters, um, brewers of today are, are experiencing challenges that have really never been experienced in the American brewing industry before, even during Prohibition, which began 100 years ago. And so I'm really eager to hear uh, about their work today. I'd also like to thank Ani Gellis and the Baltimore Museum of Industry for planning and hosting this conversation. Uh, as Scott mentioned, I am curator of the American Brewing History Initiative at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History in Washington, DC. This is not where the dinosaurs live. Uh, those uh, live next door at the National Museum of Natural History. It is where the Star Spangled Banner lives, and I will speak much more about that in a moment. Uh, the American Brewing History Initiative is a project now almost four years old to build an archive of the histories of home brewing and craft beer at the Smithsonian. And to that end, my typical work involves travel around the country uh, to meet with brewers, maltsters, writers, homebrew shop owners, all the many people who compose the American brewing industry today. And when I meet with people, I often record an oral history with them. And I also request the donation of objects or documents that can preserve the stories of their very creative careers. And I'm very happy to say that as of October 2019, artifacts related to home brewing and microbrewing history can now be found on the exhibit floor at the National Museum of American History. Uh, there's a new section in the museum's popular food history exhibit where Julia Child's kitchen lives, 
uh, that now explores the birth of home brewing and craft beer in California and Colorado in its earliest decades. And after more than six months of being closed due to the pandemic, our museum will reopen to the public tomorrow, uh, September 25th. And so please consider a trip to DC to see these wonderful artifacts firsthand. Now, as I always like to say, these kinds of objects have a place on our exhibit floor uh, for the simple reason that brewing history is American history, that we can understand the greatest trends, events, and themes in the American story through the lens of beer. And you'll see here just a sampling of the many, many objects in our collections related to brewing history. One of my very favorites on the right, it's a, it's a bit humorous, it's a piece of sheet music from the Prohibition era. I never knew I had a wonderful wife until the town went dry. Um, re referring to the man on the right who probably is used to spending his time at the saloon, but now the saloon is closed and suddenly his wife seems much more interesting. Uh, beer is the most consumed alcoholic beverage in the US and has been for much of our nation's history. The U.S. currently counts more than 8,000 breweries, far more than ever before, and more than 1 million Americans brew at home. And I really appreciated the invitation to think and talk with you about Baltimore's brewing history in particular because the most substantial collection of artifacts related to beer history that I work with at the American History Museum, uh, it was donated by a Baltimore-based brewer and beer history enthusiast. His name was Walter Voigt, and over the course of his career brewing in Baltimore, he gathered a really large assortment of things like brewery signs, uh, cans, can openers, the material culture of taverns like this faucet knob, technical brewing equipment like this beautiful colorimeter, uh, books, and other materials that really helped shed light on beer in Baltimore and the nation in the late 1800s and early to mid-1900s. And these objects from the Voigt collection have really proven very useful. Um, regardless of the setting, they've enabled me to talk about virtually the full scope of American beer history. And what that says is that Baltimore brewing history is in many ways so exemplary of our national history of beer that we can understand the history of brewing in the U.S. pretty perfectly through the lens of Baltimore. So my goal for the next uh, 15 minutes or so is to lead you on a very, very quick tour through some of the high points of American brewing history using artifacts from the Voigt collection specific to Baltimore when possible um, to give an understanding of the people and places and events that have led us to this current golden age of craft beer as exemplified by the brewers who will speak right after me. Um, to organize our thoughts, I will focus unequally on five dates of interest, and my comments will emphasize the earlier end of the historical spectrum, um, as I suspect these years may be less familiar or at least uh, less present in our collective memory. So the first date of 1784, um, what was happening in the U.S. at the time? Well, the colonies had declared independence from Great Britain in 1776, fought the Revolutionary War and won the year previous in 1783, uh, and during this year, 1784, the American states are getting ready to collaborate on the writing of the Constitution. So in general, this is a time of political and social and cultural upheaval, uncertainty, and isolation. Many American towns during this early era had two primary kinds of public buildings, churches and taverns. So that tells us right away that early Americans prayed and they liked their tipple. Benjamin Fordham, born in London, founded Maryland's first brewery in Annapolis in 1703. He focused on sailors as, as his primary customers. And Baltimore got its first brewery about a half century later in 1748, uh, thanks to John and Elias Daniel Barnett's father and son who immigrated from the Bavarian region of Germany. So when this map was drawn that you see here, it's from 1781, um, I'm sorry, yeah, 1781, Baltimore's first uh, brewery was already more than 30 years in its past. And again, at the moment when this map was drawn, men, women, and children all drank alcohol, um, but most of what they consumed was not actually beer. Um, rather, the most popular alcoholic drink in colonial and early Republic America per capita was apple cider, and a pretty strong cider at that, around 10% alcohol. Americans were also enthusiastic consumers of distilled spirits like whiskey, gin, brandy, and rum. Somewhere in this mix uh, was beer. And let me return to this. Um, but it plays a much quieter role in this early era compared to later eras, and that's uh, largely for one pretty particular reason, and that's that beer requires cool temperatures to make and hold, as many brewers will tell you, otherwise it spoils very easily. And so it's no accident that other cities like Milwaukee or St. Louis with their cold climates would really eventually become naturally important centers for American brewing. Uh, on this topic, a German immigrant by the name of David Yingling immigrated to the U.S. in 1828, 
he got off the boat in Baltimore. He wanted to start a brewery, but uh, he just didn't feel like the climate or landscape of Baltimore was quite ideal. And so he moved the following year to Pottsville, Pennsylvania, uh, with its hills and cooler temperatures and founded a brewery there in his name. Um, now, due to challenges like these, it was really most often practical to import beer during the colonial era uh, or brew it in small quantities for consumption at home or in taverns or boarding houses. Brewing was a domestic chore, much like baking bread, and we know that enslaved people and women were heavily involved in brewing beer during these early years um, from a variety of historical sources, like the one you can see quoted here. Uh, we have ledgers showing the sale of hops grown by enslaved people to Thomas Jefferson's household, uh, ads like this one announcing the auction of enslaved people who were skilled in brewing, Women's diaries like these pages, uh, which were written by a midwife in Maine named Martha Ballard. She mentioned brewing beer alongside other household chores. Um, and eventually recipes in early American cookbooks like this. Um, the Virginia Housewife, published in 1824, is considered the first originally American cookbook. Still, early Americans did open professional breweries in the late 1700s and early 1800s. Um, Baltimore's first sizable brewery arrived in 1784, um, founded by a man named Thomas Peters who had come to the city from Philadelphia after the Revolutionary War. And the papers of George Washington, uh, preserved by the National Archives, contain a really interesting exchange of letters between Washington and this brewer, in which Washington is looking for barley that he can plant on his plantation at Mount Vernon so he can brew beer. Um, and they, they exchanged several, um, several messages, and in the end, Peters is not able to help him uh, find barley. But in the years following these letters, Thomas Peters Brewery passed on to different owners, and it was in 1813 uh, when the brewery was known as Brown's Brewery that uh, this early era of Baltimore brewing history really played its greatest role in our national history. So if you are a Baltimorean, you are surely familiar with this story. At 1813, the very young U.S. was once again at war with Great Britain. And Mary Pickersgill, a 37-year-old widow in Baltimore, uh, was experienced at sewing ships, colors, and signal flags. And she was commis commissioned to sew, with the kinds of tools you see on the upper left, a large American flag to fly over Fort McHenry during the conflict. This flag would, of course, come to be known as the Star Spangled Banner and would inspire our national anthem by the same name. The flag she would make would measure 30 by 42 feet. And those dimensions exceeded the size of her home. You can see the, the, the dimensions of her home at that time um, uh, imposed uh, underneath the flag. And so there was just simply no way she could assemble such a large flag inside her house. And so she was given permission by the owner of Brown's Brewery to sew the flag on the floor of one of his brewery's malt houses. Um, and as many of you know, malting barley is, of course, a critical step in the brewing process. It unlocks the sugars in barley grain to make them available for yeast to consume um, so it can expel carbon dioxide and alcohol to make beer. And malting barley involves first steeping the barley in water, and then in the traditional floor malting method, maltsters spread out the malt on a large floor of a malt house. And while the grain is on the floor, maltsters turn it by hand twice a day um, with a wooden shovel or a 70 pound iron malt rake, as you see here, um, dragging it through the grains. And then once the grain is germinated properly, the malt is heated or kilned um, and then dried. So looking at this photo minus the support columns, you can imagine the owner of Brown's Brewery saying to Pickerskill, yes, we have a large flat open room that would be perfect for assembling a large flat flag. And so Pickersgill built the Star Spangled Banner in the malt house with the assistance of her mother and four teenage girls under the age of 16, including an African-American indentured servant. Many years later, the flag was donated to the Smithsonian, restored, and since 2008, it's been on display in a state-of-the-art climate control chamber at the heart of our museum. Uh, so the flag represents an important thread, uh, if you'll excuse the pun, in Baltimore's brewing history and its place in American history. Now, in all of these settings in Baltimore, whether beer was brewed at home or in some of the city's uh, early professional breweries, these beers were predominantly English-style ales that used a yeast that sat on top of fermentation vessels and produced beers that were often fairly heavy-bodied and dark in color and consumed at room temperature. Um, but by the mid-1800s, beer in Baltimore and the nation was really on the cusp of enormous change. And if we fast forward 100 years from our initial date to our second date of interest, 1885, um, we find a very different story that beer has transitioned to the center of the American diet and the American uh, social life. It looks and tastes completely different. And this is thanks to the first great revolution in American brewing, as scholars have put it, which occurred in the mid-1800s. 
In the course of a single generation, uh, from the 1830s through 1860s, seven and a half million immigrants arrived from Northern Europe, many from present-day Germany and the Czech Republic, including um, the brewers you see here on the screen who worked at Eigenbrot Brewery in Baltimore, Maryland. And if you can see a lot of them sitting in the, in the center in the front uh, have these tankards or steins on their, on their knees, um, very likely brought with them when they immigrated. Brewers like these brought with them a very different method for making beer using yeasts that worked on the bottom of fermentation vessels. They aged their beer under cool conditions and these techniques produced a lager, which was very different from the ales that preceded it. These lagers were light bodied and clear and cold and effervescent and Americans were just completely entranced. And this explosive growth in people and breweries that followed um, is very visible in Baltimore, which served as a critical port of entry for immigrants. Um, this map, which you see here, depicts the city only 70 years after the first map I showed you. So imagine such, such incredible growth in just such a short time span. Um, in 1830, Baltimore counted 80,000 people and four breweries in the city. In 1850, just 20 years later, more than double the population, 169,000 people and 29 breweries. And so with the immigration of expert German brewmasters, beer suddenly became big business, huge business in cities like Baltimore and across the country. And the work of brewing transitioned out of the home into sophisticated breweries. It was no longer a domestic chore for women or Americans of color. Rather, it became a profession done by European or immigrant men in factory-like settings and went to serve primarily men who enjoyed the beer in saloons. Um, we also see components of, uh, of, of this entire story of German immigrants uh, coming to the United States in Baltimore's uh, many prominent breweries of the mid and late 1800s and early 1900s. And so there's a, these, these dynasties of German names uh, that uh, founded and ran these really impressive businesses. These include the Wiesner family. They founded a brewery in 1863 and then greatly expanded in 1887 to this beautiful Bavarian Gothic brew house. Um, later known as the American Brewery. Baltimoreans will surely recognize this uh, beautiful temple to beer. We have a photo of this brewery in our collection at the American History Museum showing delivery men to these delivery carts lined up in front of the brewery. Uh, also the Baronschmidt family who brewed in the 1860s and beyond. Um, in 1864, George Baronschmidt was the first of, of this family and then his son Frederick would go on to build a much bigger brewery around 1900. Um, you'll see here a sign from that brewery in our collection and then also uh, a tray um, that was likely used in a saloon or a, a tied tavern, a tied house to the brewery. Many of these early large breweries in Baltimore would cluster in Brewers Row uh, along or near North Gay Street and then a second cluster would grow on the east side of the city in Brewers Hill. One of these founded in 1885, uh, which is the reason for our nominal focus on this date, would be the very famous National Brewing Company, which would make National Bohemian and National Premium brands. Um, now, as the 1800s came to a close, brewing became so competitive and big breweries were so big uh, that companies in Baltimore and across the U.S. consolidated. Um, but the greatest threat of all to breweries in Baltimore and anywhere would come in 1920, uh, our third date with the arrival of Prohibition. Now, even if beer had long enjoyed a fairly healthful reputation in the U.S., uh, beer would um, kind of come under the gun when uh, temperance activists um, looked to kind of shut down alcohol production in the early 20th century. And in particular, the proliferation of saloons and criticisms of the saloon, uh, which were primarily a thinly veiled anxiety about the immigrants who patronized saloons, tipped the nation into this ban on the production, transportation, and sale of alcoholic beverages. And prohibition was completely devastating to the American brewing industry. It ceased operations at American breweries, at least in terms of brewing beer. Uh, many tried to repurpose their operations. Schlitz in Milwaukee made Famo, a, an, an non-alcoholic hopped beverage. Yingling made ice cream. Coors in Colorado made ceramics. But many breweries just had to completely shut down. A monumental brewing company in, in Baltimore, for example, clearly aimed high when it opened in 1900 and, and um, expected to produce 300,000 barrels of beer per year. But um, when Prohibition arrived in 1920, it had to sell all of its properties and close completely. To say Prohibition was unpopular in Maryland would be an understatement. Uh, Maryland earned the nickname the Free State because of its resistance to enforcing Prohibition restrictions led by the governor at the time. Uh, and when Prohibition was finally repealed in 1933, which is our fourth significant date, this famous photograph captured the very well-known Baltimore-based author H.L. Mencken uh, completely over the moon as he enjoyed his first legal post-repeal beer, which was an arrow, at the Rennert Hotel at 12.30 a.m. on April 7th, 1933. 
Um, now, Prohibition's repeal was, of course, good news for American brewers, uh, but the industry's recovery was very rocky and slow. Um, 13 years of a ban on alcohol production had really wiped out many small breweries that had been the guardians of ethnic and regional traditions in European lager beer production. And so what was left was mostly big breweries with regional or national reach. Uh, and so uniformity and efficiency and standardization became the qualities to pursue an American beer in the mid 20th century. And as you might expect, fewer breweries increasingly made similar beer, which was a light lager style uh, and to compete with each other. Uh, but this style was and continues to be very popular among many Americans who were happy to have beers that were easy drinking and bitter. Um, in the decades following Prohibition's repeal, Baltimore's National Brewing Company enjoyed its heyday. In 1954, the brewery produced one million barrels and shared ownership with the Orioles prompted it to be the beer of Memorial Stadium and the official beer of Baltimore. It was also during these years that Walter Voigt, who would later donate his collection to the Smithsonian, worked as a brewer in Baltimore, um, but he worked for one of National's competitors for the American Brewing Company. Um, nevertheless, the 60s and 70s saw the century's second wave of breweries consolidation and a further tilt away from regional beers toward national brands. And uh, again, it may be difficult to tell, but American breweries reached peak consolidation in 1978, when one count put the national total at 89, the New York Times counted even fewer, uh, just 44. And the Baltimore beer scene certainly reflected this national trend. The Sun reported that in 1955, uh, Maryland brewed beers accounted for 88% of the local market, but by 1974, Maryland brewed beers were only 22% of the local market. So breweries like American Brewery, where Voight brewed closed, National Brewery merged and then closed. Its famous brands were sold to other larger breweries, discontinued, uh, only to be much later revived. Um, Mr. Bow lives on, of course. Uh, and Walter Voigt died in 1983, a decade after the American Brewery shut its doors. Now, when Voigt died in 1983, I wonder if he had an inkling of the coming sea change in American beer, the second great revolution in American brewing, uh, what would come to be known as the microbrewing or craft beer revolution. The same New York Times article that had reported on this intense consolidation in 1978 did seem to have a hint as to what was about to come. And the reporter noted an uptick in sales and imported beers and also talked about some changes afoot at Anchor Brewing Company, which had been taken over by Fritz Maytag in San Francisco in 1965. So the New York Times reporter wrote in 1978, who knows, for some of the nostalgia ridden beer drinkers, the future may hold a few echoes of the good old days. Uh, as we know very well, more than just echoes of the good old days were on the horizon. Uh, the 70s, 80s, and beyond saw a really vibrant groundswell of energy in American homebrewing. Uh, the first microbreweries and brew pubs throughout the West, uh, the Pacific Northwest, the Chesapeake region, and a coming tidal wave of microbreweries. And again, the history of Baltimore and Maryland really tracked these national trends. Microbrew beer came to Baltimore in the late 80s with breweries like British Brewing Company, founded in 1988. So that is our final date of note. Um, Sissons, later Clipper City and Heavy Seas, um, Baltimore Brewing Company, the arrival of Flying Dog, and many others. And uh, the current count of uh, breweries in, in Maryland, um, I checked the federal government statistics and as of June 30th, 2020, the federal government counted 164 breweries in the state of Maryland. This is after beginning the count in 1989 when the government had only noted three breweries in the state. And as you can see in this graphic produced by the Brewers Association, 112 of those breweries are claimed by the BA, um, which is the nonprofit that promotes craft breweries as, as craft operations. Um, they generally generate nearly a billion dollars in economic impact and brew almost 302,000 barrels of craft beer each year. Um, three of those brewers are, of course, are with us tonight, and they brew in a city whose beer history stretches more than 300 years and can claim artifacts as illustrious as the Star Spangled Banner. And so I am eager to hear about their work, uh, and I'll conclude my remarks here. So thank you very much. Stop sharing. That's great. Okay. Thanks so much, Teresa. I'm Ani Gellis from the BMI. Just want to thank everyone for coming this evening. And uh, brewers, if you want to turn your cameras back on and, and get on the, um, the call, that would be great. All right, I see Judy. I see Tom. Hey, guys. Spike, are you there? 
So um, audience members, feel free to submit questions via the Q&A function. Um, if you use the chat by mistake, that's fine too. We'll still find your questions. And um, while we're waiting for some questions to come in, Brewers, do you want to just talk for a few minutes about what the industry is like at this very particular moment in history? Sure, I can go first if you guys want. Um, so for us, I'm, a, I'm one of the owners of Diamondback Brewing. So we're down here in Locust Point, South Baltimore. Um, and kind of to speak a little bit just about the industry, uh, we've definitely seen a lot of changes since the you know COVID-19 impacts, uh, primarily sort of switching to package products. Uh, I think Judy and Spike can probably attest to this, but being no bars and stuff are open, uh, you know, 100% of our production was going to can product. Um, and that was a big change for us, at least, because, you know, I'm not set up as an operation to do that. So we had to make a lot of adjustments in packaging and purchasing and scheduling and, and staffing. So pretty much everything uh, to make that work. Um, and on top of that, you know, being small brewers and uh, like tap room is huge for everybody. You know, that's where you make your most margin on everything and not being able to be open and only being able to operate, you know, in an outdoor setting definitely limits your potential income each month. So you have to kind of attest to that. And there's deli delivery models and stuff like that that have developed that have been very successful. Um, but I'm sure each of us have kind of found a different niche uh, to be successful in that regard. Um, yeah, so I'm Judy Neff, uh, owner and brewer at Checker Spot Brewing. And um, yeah, it's COVID has been crazy. Uh, it was definitely uh, interesting at the beginning, um, switching over to uh, online ordering system. Um, so I'm sure as nobody was really set up for this um, to be able to order really anything online. Um, so that happened really, really quickly and everyone was really supportive and, and very patient with, with us. Uh, so that was great. Um, our big thing is we got a canning line. So we were always planning to get a canning line but we're looking at it more this summer, this fall type thing. And so it became a big, a big rush. So we were really lucky. We got a uh, canning line that was supposed to go to the craft brewers conference. So we were able to get a canning line in about four weeks, which is crazy. <laughs> they usually take uh, months wow. to get. So um, it's been, yeah, it's been a whirlwind since we got the canning line and um, yeah, just having outdoor seating and just really trying to protect our staff, um, our customers um, and ourselves um, and sort of playing it day by day, month by month um, and see where we go, go from there. Hi, I'm Spike from uh, Key Brown, I'm one of the owners. And uh, just much like what Tom and, and Judy just said, we all had to like pivot so hard and it was it was uh it was tough at first but you know it, it, everyone in this business is pretty resilient so we figured a way to do it but you know when you go from uh, a business model that has a lot of a mixture of your tap room keg sales and package when all of a sudden it just goes to heavy package it's it's a it's a shock to the system it doesn't matter whether you're big small little medium it's it really is um you, know, you just have to be on your on top of your game at the at that point so um we're, we're lucky i think all three of us you know we agree we're we're very fortunate that we have revenue coming in and we've got a we had an avenue to sell our product um it's maybe a different style that we'd sell our product in sometimes but um you know we've we just we just grow with the situation and i think that's what makes maryland brewing uh, the, the society and, and even the United States so strong. <laughs> All right, great, thank you. Um, and I see we've got a question through the Q&A, one from Laura. Um, this is actually a question for Teresa. Uh, I think she answered that offline. Oh, or she's going to answer it now. I'm happy to say, and I receive this kind of question often if people are interested in um, researching their family history 
uh, related to the beer industry, you know, where can they look uh, if, if they think that family members worked in breweries or uh, owned breweries? And so I always say the best place to start is uh, a local, um, whatever the city or state library or archives might be, and the librarians and archivists will have great ideas for you. But um, good resources are always things like historical editions of city directories, um, records of property ownership and transferal. Uh, there are wonderful fire insurance maps from the late 1800s, early 1900s that will show um, individual individual blocks, you know, who owns particular properties on particular blocks. Um, so those would be places to start. Also, federal census records are online up until, you know, uh, there's a few decades that have are, are kept from public view, but um, but there are a lot of different kinds of places to look uh, if you think that uh, someone that you know by name or uh, by the location where they lived or worked uh, might have been involved in beer. So we have another, um, uh, there's a comment that came in through the QA and that's from Austin and he said he just wanted to say thank you to the brewers for their hard work especially during the pandemic because it's a luxury to continue to enjoy local brews during this time so thank you to all of you for doing that um, and we also had a question through the chat uh, were there sorry, were there any legislative changes that enabled the rise of craft brewing Um, I, being able to open a tap room is why we were finally able to open a brewery. Uh, so ours is tap room focused. Again, we've just started to turn a lot more towards production right now. Um, but the idea was to have a place where people could come and taste the beer where the beer was made. Um, and, you know, without having that, it's really hard to be profitable. For, for many, many, many years. So a lot of places that started as production only and could not do a tap room. Um, you know, it takes so many years just, just to start to turn a profit. Um, so it makes it a very, very tough uh, business model. So being able to sort of start out immediately and talk to your customers and serve the beer in your tap room made it something that was something that we could actually do and, you know, and pay our mortgage at the same time and keep, keep our house. <laughs> Yeah, yeah and as I, I travel around. Every state has a different story. Uh, every state has a different um, legislative action that allowed for beer to be sold on site. And so for a lot of reasons, that's why states in the West have a, an earlier history of brew pubs and, and tap rooms. And, you know, people ask, why is the history of D.C. craft beer so different from the history of Colorado or California? And in a lot of places, it all hinges on when the state allowed beer to be sold on site in tap rooms. Um, so Judy's totally right that it's, it allows enormous expansion as soon as that kind of legislation is able to be passed. Yeah, it also helps, especially in Maryland, how when you get your brewing license, it also comes with a liquor license, like contingent on certain factors. Cause I know like in certain counties and stuff, like the private market for liquor license is insane. And like to have the budget for also obtaining a liquor license would be crazy. Whereas like you can just pay the flat rate to get your brewing license and it just comes with a liquor license is sort of easy, especially in startup costs. Well, I, I also like the fact that we can um, have the brewing, the tap room to test new products. And I think that's really important when you're a production brewery um, is the ability to put a beer out in your tap room and, and let, your, let your fans who love your beer come in here, um, try it out. And, you know, sometimes we put stuff out there in a tap room. And they're like, no, I don't think so. And that prevents us from making a really expensive mistake out, of, out in the uh, in distro and, and out in the, uh, you know, wherever, wherever we, we throw our product out. So. And Ani asked me to, um, to keep an eye on the Q&A um, just for some ambient child noise in the background, which I completely understand. Um, and so there, there's a question for brewers. If you've had to modify the types and numbers of beer you're brewing because of the pandemic, how has production changed aside from packaging your beer? All right, so I'll, I'll just dive right in. Um, so a lot of our core products we found during the pandemic um, became the demand for them on our off-premise accounts, which are the liquor stores 
and the bottle shops, um, it became so great that we had to kind of sometimes fall back on creating new products. So it's a good, it's a double-edged sword. You know, we, we wanted to create new products, but we also had to keep up demand on our core products. Um, it's kind of like even down at this point. And so we're getting back to being able to introduce new products. So complete, uh, complete double-edged sword. Yeah, I would agree with you, Spike. We had a, a bunch of sort of the same issues, but basically like we have a one main IPA that we brew and, you know, you're confident in brewing that beer, you know, the distributor will sell it, you know, it will do well on the market. But uh, when you're brewing new products, you risk the chance that the distributor might come back and say, hey, I only want 30 cases of that instead of the 150 that you had projected going out the door. And you can't sell the rest of that out of the tap room. So you're kind of reliant on the fact that this product can sell well in the market. And under these circumstances, you don't necessarily know that everything you're brewing is going to be moving as fast as what you know will sell out there. Yeah, we've been fortunate because we just started canning. So, um, you know, I'll, we were really new for all these liquor stores and um, accounts always like the new thing, the next new thing. Um, so because we were new, um, we didn't have to really worry about things like that because everything was new, whether we had made it before or not. Um, so we've been focusing, obviously, at the beginning a lot on the New England style IPAs, the hazy IPAs, um, because we know that those are the number one sellers in the tap room, I'm sure in everybody's tap room and in all bars. Um, so we really started, you know, jumped in with two feet, really starting on that. And then now have had the luxury of being able to spread out to you know some other styles of of beer um which is fun more fun for me <laughs> can i ask you what what are each of your favorite styles to brew loggers <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah pilsner probably <laughs> that was easy <laughs> and, they, and they take the longest time too that's the that's the tough part, right? <laughs> yep. And why do you prefer to brew these lager styles compared to IPAs, which have been so popular among uh, craft beer lovers for the last several decades? Well, specifically on the brew day, um, you don't have to deal with just so much hops, which uh, a lot of our systems aren't built to be able to take this amount of hops. So it, it works fine, but um, it, it's a lot more of a struggle, I guess physically brewing um, the IPA. And, you know, I tend to enjoy lagers. Um, so I drink a lot of Pilsner and, you know, Oktoberfest uh, is my favorite fall style of beer. So it's when you're making it and then you can get excited about drinking it later. Yeah, I would also say, like, in, it's, sorry to cut you off, but um, like the market is so, like filled with hazy IPA right now and it kind of has been for a while so it's it's like kind of nice to pivot to something that you know you're not bombarded with every day um, it's not every day that you get like an unfiltered lager from a craft brewer so it's kind of cool when you go to somewhere and you see that on tap or something like that I kind of think it's like um, everyone every grandma has their favorite you know every, everybody has their favorite apple pie and it's apple pie is an easy, you know, you think it's easy to make. Lagers are, you think it's easy to make because it's kind of a, a very simple, like, beer. But it's not. It's really hard to make. And I think that's, that's uh, there's a lot of, like, like we take a lot of pride in our lagers. And I know Tom, I know you guys do, and I know Judy does. And it's, it's, a, it's a source yeah. of just, like, like, you're proud about it. You know, it's, a, it's not, it's, an, it's a very simple beer. But you can you can mess it up so quickly. Um, so yeah, it's 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 just pride, I think. A little bit of a challenge too. Yeah. And it takes a lot of time. Yeah. yeah. And I've read a little bit and talked to some brewers about loggers being um, 
that that time factor is actually perhaps an advantage during this COVID era when maybe you find yourself um, needing to age beers or hold them for a longer amount of time. Do you feel like that that's going to be um, something of a consideration for your breweries or is it more of a, a taste factor for you? Um, we've had to produce so much more beer because we started canning. So it's actually makes it even more, di more difficult for us to do lagers because they're taking up tank space that we could turn around an IPA quicker. Um, but yeah, it's because they're so good. Yeah, you can't look at the numbers because then you won't want to do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. 100%. <laughs> and I, I mean, see every brewery's like conundrum is like, you know, or brewery's conundrum is like, all right, man, I really love this beer, but it takes 30 plus days to do. Yeah. And do we have that tank space to do that? <laughs> Possibly enough for 30 plus days. Um, now, I see a question in the, a couple questions in the chat about um, growers and, and suppliers in Maryland. People wonder if there are maltsters and uh, if you could talk a bit about the local supply pipelines related to hops and malt. Um, are there local people you partner with and have those supply chains been impacted by COVID? Um, we have one of our beers, our sour beer, um, we always use 100% local ingredients. So we get our wheat from Dark Cloud Malt House and our um, two row barley base from um, Chesapeake Malting, uh, which they now have a brewery up at Hopkins Farm. And I mean, we haven't had really supply chain issues with them. They, you know, they're smaller. Um, so they, you know, they do their best to get us what we, what we absolutely need. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't actually know how COVID has affected them, them too much. Uh, but we've, we've sort of kept up buying, buying from them. Yeah, I don't know how COVID's done that really, but I know like Maryland in general is like kind of a tough growing region for some of these guys and like the humidity and mold factor on some of the barley has been a bit of an issue in the past for some of the growers around here. So I think some of those contingency factors impact it almost more than anything else really. Yeah. We, we try and work with as many local purveyors as we can. Um, and I, just to support, just to support, but also, you know, it's, um, I think COVID has, has hurt some of them. Um, you know, they've lost some customers, obviously, um, as, but, but it's tough. It's tough all around. I think we're all, you know, all as local producers of the product, um, we're all, you know, kind of hurting in some sense and we're all trying to support each other. Yeah. And I think yeah. Tom's right. I think they're more, I think they're more dependent on the, the weather's a, a bigger deal, <laughs> you yeah. know, with all the fruit, uh, we do all local fruit as well and that's you know for them it's the weather is such a big deal um i think much less than covid right now yeah and also the cost too because like i know buying from like dark cloud can sometimes be like twice as expensive as purchasing from you know like one of the macro producers so i would assume with like everything going in on with COVID and people trying to cut costs and stuff that that might have impacted them negatively because it's hard to justify paying twice as much when you're pinching pennies. Yeah. Would you feel like you hear that customers care about these local suppliers up the chain or is that really a decision that you three make as brewers that matters to you? Um, it's a decision that we've made, um, you know, to help support not just other local brewers, but also, you know, supporting the local community. Um, sort of the idea if every if every brewery used local ingredients and one beer here and there, they they probably can't even supply. You know, the small guys can't even supply that much. Um, so it's just sort of keeping them doing what they're doing. Yeah, I think there has been like because the the trend of going local right and like shopping local and go, I think sort of parallels the boom in craft beer industry and like I feel like during COVID a lot of people were searching for alternative ways to buy food just as the grocery store was so crazy and stuff and I've talked to a few like butcher kind of guys and, and cattle farmers and they've said like business has been crazy because people have wanted that local factor and 
I think people do care about it in the beer industry as well. Like when you have a beer on tap and you can say like, hey, this uses local cherries or local peaches or something. I think it does attract a certain kind of customer. I see a question in the chat for me. Um, this is from someone, I was involved with the redevelopment of the old Natty Bow site in Brewers Hill. Are you aware of other breweries in the country that have gone through extensive adaptive reuse? And if so, what have they become? Um, and two examples come to mind immediately. The first is um, the Over the Rhine neighborhood in Cincinnati is filled with uh, 19th century breweries. They have a very similar history of German immigration to the city. And when I traveled there, I um, recorded an oral history with the head of, of what has now become the, um, it's an urban redevelopment committee that is specifically focused in the brewery neighborhood. And uh, so it's not quite the same question as, as the reuse of a particular space, but um, he's really tried to rethink the entire neighborhood and um, how it might be a new kind of attraction for Cincinnatians, but also visitors to the city. And so they have a, a really interesting um, walking tour of the neighborhood where they have, um, it, it's partnered with a, a new public art program. And so as you walk around, you see murals on all the walls that reference the old uh, brewery history or historical markers. Uh, this neighborhood is full of these amazing lagering caves underneath the streets of Cincinnati, which you can tour and um, the touring of that will become more um, you know, easier to do in the coming years. So, you know, it's really trying to think of a whole neighborhood on, on that front. And then other than that, I'm, I'm also aware of a project that's in development in Michigan where um, someone's trying to rethink a large brewery in terms of a, a, a performance space, the big uh, music venue, but I'm sure there are many other examples throughout the country. Um, and I don't know if any of the brewers can think, have examples of that that you can think of either. If not, I have a couple more questions, certainly for the brewers here in the chat box. Um, one is if there are emerging trends that uh, we should keep an eye out for. So what styles do you see on the horizon, um, judging from your experiences in the brew house? So I'm going to throw that question back to the person who asked that, because I'd like to know too, because these styles change so much. It's like one day it's, you know, Two years ago, it was doing live IPAs. Now it's pastry stouts. Now it's, um, you know, fruited sours. So, I mean, we're, you know, honestly, as a production brewery, we're just having a hard time keeping up with, like, guessing styles. Because, and we can look to other breweries around the nation and the world, um, but it, it really, it, it's difficult. Because everything, it seems like the tide just, like, rolls in and rolls out very quickly. And one minute it's pastry stouts, the next minute it's fruit of sour. So, um, yeah, I, I'd like to know. <laughs> Hopefully Judy or, or Tom can give me some guidance on this I, one. I don't think hazy IPAs are going anywhere anytime soon. Um, it really opened up IPAs to people that didn't like the bitter, bitter beers. And so it made IPAs much more accessible to the general population who likes beer. Um, so, you know, they're, they're still very, very relatively new, uh, new style. And I think it's just going to continue to compound on that. So it's, you know, it's probably going to be, you know, remember when there was the white IPA, the rye IPA, the, the you know, every iteration of, a, of an IPA is probably going to now be every iteration of a New England IPA. Yeah, I think, <laughs> I, I think they also go in cycles too, right? So like, five years ago or probably even 10 years ago, people wanted like the biggest, boldest IPAs you could get. And then, you know, session IPAs started taking off a little bit and now we're kind of back to like haziest IPA you can possibly make. And kind of also coming back now is like this sort of locale diet IPA kind of trend that I've been seeing across the board. And that's sort of just like another way to rephrase a session IPA. So I think they kind of just cycle sort of with the times things that were popular will once again become popular again so it's really hard to keep up with honestly <laughs> and i see when i travel around the country you know many brewers say that craft well studies of, of craft beer demographics show that people say they want variety and, and clearly that's very challenging to the brewer that you know someone walks into a tap room and wants to see something different you know 10 different things on the menu every time they walk in that's um it's not that's not always practical for um just 
based on the, the kind of time it, it takes to brew beer and to, to prepare it. So, um, so yes, I, I can totally understand the challenges. Um, I have a, another couple of questions here from um, participants. Um, are you limited in Maryland to the amount of beer you can brew? And another question, how much of brewers education comes from home brewing versus a formal program or learning on the job? The answer to the first question is no, right? <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I think the, only, no. the only thing they're limited. <laughs> I'm sure it's no. Yeah, well, you get class. That's the tapping sales, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Come on, state wants money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, and I started out home brewing. Uh, is how I got into beer, well, drinking, and then home home brewing. Um, I guess now about 15 years ago, and sort of spiraled out of control with with that did uh did it a lot um but then I sort of took that time you know I read every book there was every I got my hands on everything I could possibly get my hands on and you know with the age of the internet now that's a lot you know so there is formal education that you can get um but if you sort of take the time and have the interest you can sort of teach yourself the other big thing was um, years before we opened, really made an effort to get to know all the other brewers that were out there, um, spend time with them, talk to them, brew with them. Um, there's nothing like practical on the job experience. You can take a class about how to brew beer and until you do it, you know, it's not really gonna make a lot of sense. Um, so that's just my two cents that sort of hand, hands on is, is really how you learn. Um, and you got to really, everybody's system is a little bit different too. So you'll hear people say, uh, you know, you got to dial in the system. Um, but it's true. Every system has its little quirks and, um, you really do. You have to get to know your system and how, how to hit the points that you want to hit and what you need to do to get there. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I would agree with you, Judy, because, I mean, we've probably brewed 600 batches of beer at Diamondback, but if you dropped me into Judy's system or Spike system, I probably would have no clue what I was doing, you know? So the mechanical side of things is almost just as important as sort of knowing the science behind it. Yeah, you know, and, and we have, um, so so we, we have a little bit bigger system, but if I took... Um, and, and believe me, I don't get to brew on the big system. I get to brew on the little 15 gallon system <laughs> when, when Mike, my partner, business partner lets me do it. It's not very often, but, um, if Mike who brews on a 40 barrel system goes and brews on Tom, your system or Judy's system, he'd be lost too. It's, it's all like the nuances of your system, big, small, little, it doesn't, it doesn't even really matter. Um, but you've got to learn them and, and, you know, it doesn't. You know, we have some homebrewers come in all the time and, you know, it, it's like they're looking at this system. And I think, Tom, Judy, you get the same thing. And they're like, oh, my God, this is crazy. And it's like, well, <laughs> you just got to learn it. You know, it does yeah. size to size. You scale down. You learn the tricks. And then you go from there. Yeah, the thing going from homebrewing to commercial brewing, um, it, it's really a treat. So it's it's getting able to do all the things I wanted to do as a home brewer, but couldn't afford to do it, you know, because home brewing, you're buying all this stuff. It's ex and it, the ingredients are expensive. The stainless steel is expensive. So you're buying all this stuff and then you're giving your beer away to people because you can't sell any beer. Um, whereas then when you start doing it commercially, you know, you can oxygenate in line as you're transferring it to the fermenter. It's, it's all these things that, I always wanted to do, but never, you know, I hadn't gotten there financially, I guess, <laughs> on a homebrew scale to be able to do these things. Um, so I think that's sort of a, a big difference you see. I, th I think you can manage the variables, the smaller variables on a, on a commercial system a little better than you can on a homebrewing system. And that's what, that's, that's probably the biggest difference between the two. Yeah. 
have a question uh, here about um, how much of your success is dependent on distributors versus on-site consumption um, and drinkers coming coming in for on-site consumption for community and fellowship. So um, package versus on-site sales. What is your typical balance? Um, and, and you all mentioned at the beginning that you're packaging almost exclusively now. Yeah, I think it really depends on your goals, honestly. Like if you want to be like a big time brewer and bring 10,000 barrels of beer a year, uh, you really have to focus on that distribution side and grow those channels. Um, and Spike can probably speak to this better since he's a little bit larger than we are. But like, if if you're fine with just brewing like uh, experimental beer and you know you're not gauging your success on the amount of money that you make, then you could probably do fine on a system in a small little town and make a fine living that way also. I think uh, I think my business partner Mike would say he'd much rather have a smaller system because it gives you a little bit more freedom. Um, but, you know, we do have a bigger system. So for us, um, the the distribution is the make or break. Um, you know, every time we brew a batch of beer, we have a lot we have a lot of beer, and I got to figure out how to sell it, and we all have to figure out how to sell it. So. Um, it, it's, um, it's, a, it's a little bit of give and take. Um, sometimes we can't do the beers that we want to do, the experimental beers that we want to do, because we know that we have to sell 40 barrels <laughs> worth of that product. And that's, you know, that's a big task sometimes. So we have to play it, you know, we don't always play it safe, but sometimes we do have to play it safe. Um, but that's, a, that's just a path that we chose to do yeah and ours we um obviously we're focusing a lot more on the tap room um but sort of in line with what tom was saying you can, you can only get so big in your tap room so it, as you want to grow the growth really needs to be through distribution you know we we, we can still grow our tap room a little bit but it's going to be a marginal amount of beer that we're going to increase our sales in the tap room from this point um you know we're two and a half years old uh, so distribution is really how, you know, we need to decide how big do we want to be? How much beer do we want to make per year? And to hit those numbers is really going to have to be dictated now more and more through distribution. Oh, you're muted. Oh. I see, I see one, one final question in the chat and that's about, um, uh, the demographics of your consumers, uh, what have they been in the past and how are you working to um, widen the fold of those who are enjoying your beer? Well, I, I'm very proud that we have a lot of women who come to the brewery. Um, so I started Baltimore Beer Babes with uh, three other women in 2012, so eight years ago. And the goal was to get more women in to craft beer and educated about what goes into beer and different styles of beer. Um, you know, the idea was that they would walk into a place like Max's and, you know, tell the guy they're with what kind of beer they want to order. Um, but I've really noticed since then, just year after year after year, more and more women drinking craft beer, um, which is fantastic. Uh, makes me very, very happy. Uh, but um we you know we get a we get a pretty diverse crowd it's it, it still is predominantly white male um in the tap room as customers but it, it's definitely growing in different different arenas uh you know different yeah, we're, we're trying <laughs> yeah i think like it's also contingent on like where you are right so like i feel like our like regular crowd is just tough. And so to like expand sort of your reach in that regard, like we found that the best and most successful way to do that is just with other companies, other businesses, other, you know, entrepreneurs, whether they be white, black from the LGBT group and stuff like that, like areas that I don't necessarily have an organic presence in. If I put these people who are doing awesome things, then their, their customers and their fans and their groups will also want to come check 
check out what, what I'm doing as well. So I try and partner with as many different people as I can from various backgrounds just to sort of educate myself and expand our presence and everybody that works at the company's uh, you know mindset. So, so the uh, average age of of myself and and my business partner, you know, we're in our late 40s, early 50s. So our demographic, um, we just actually want to uh, introduce people to craft beer. So the, the greatest thing that we can do, I think for all of us, is to take someone who drinks Miller Lite or Coors Light and teach them how to drink a Pilsner that's made from Tom or, you know, Meritson that's made from Judy. Uh, yeah, and, and that's, the, that's the fun part of it. I, so, so the demographic is, it could be endless. It could be boundless. Um, it's just introducing people to a different style of beer, educating them and hoping that they really enjoy it. I think that's a great final comment, Spike. Uh, it is 8.02. Uh, so I think I'll wrap things up here. Thank you, Teresa, Spike, Tom, and Judy uh, so much. And thank you all for attending this evening. Um, we thank you so much for your support. Uh, check us out at thebmi.org. Uh, follow us on Instagram. And thank you all once again for attending. We so much appreciate it and look forward to seeing you next time. We'll see Thank you. Next you. Year in person. Thank you very much. Hey, Thank nice you. t-shirt. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I real can, I like it. Hey, I can be I can around. be bought if uh, if you'd like me to <laughs> oh, that's awesome, man. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks again. Have a great evening and a great weekend. All right. Have a good time. Right. Thank you. Thank you.